The suffragettes brought an army of women to the streets of Britain, the likes that had never been seen before or since. They burned down post boxes, they bombed buildings, they endured horrific prison sentences and barbaric force feeding, and some of them even lost their lives for their political beliefs. This was a woman's revolution, and at its head was Emmeline Pankhurst, a militant general leading her troops into a political battle. She changed the course of history, and for that, quite rightly, she's a global icon. But how much do we really know about this working mum from Manchester, England? I'm Sally Lindsay, and as we celebrate 100 years since women finally got the vote that they fought and they died for, I want to find out the true gritty Mancunian story, the blood, sweat and tears behind this mythical figure. The loves, the losses, the political passions, the family tragedies that turn this woman into the leader of an army of women. This is the story of Emmeline Pankhurst, the making of a militant. The militancy of men through all the centuries has drenched the world with blood. And for these deeds of horror and destruction, they have been rewarded with monuments, with great songs and epics. The militancy of women has harmed no human life, save the lives of those who fought the battle of righteousness. Time alone will reveal what reward will be allotted to the women. Those are Emmeline Pankhurst's own words, published in her 1914 autobiography, My Own Story, after one of her many hunger strikes in prison. But what is her story, and where did it start? Voted the woman of the 20th century, Emmeline Pankhurst is a famous face the world over. But, as performance poet Tony Walsh says in his now world-famous work, This Is The Place, it was in Manchester, England, where it all began. That this is a place where a Manchester girl named of Emmeline Pankhurst from the streets of Moss Side <laughs> led a suffragette city with sisterhood pride. Like her, I'm a proud Mancunian, passionate about politics. So I've come to the very heart of this suffragette city, on the site of the Free Trade Hall, to find out more about the girl from Moss Side who grew up to lead a revolution. Manchester, at that time, was a city full of radical campaigners, famous for demonstrations against slavery and for workers' rights. I'm here to meet Emmeline's great-nephew, Michael Goulden, to find out more about her childhood in this pioneering place. So, Michael, I know about Emmeline, the heroic figure, but I don't know anything about her family or her early days. Your family, indeed. Could you shed some light on that for me? Well, yeah, she was, um, she was born Emmeline Goulden, uh, the eldest girl in a family of 11. Wow. And her parents, we know, were both politically active in a lot of the big causes that were taking place in Manchester at that time. So this little girl was born into this? Yeah, this is a picture of Emmeline, probably 13 or 14. Wow, uh, look at that. She was clearly always the strongest personality in the family and she was her father's favourite. He got her to read the newspaper to him every morning, so she was a precocious reader. She read from, I think, the age of three. Wow. And that was kind of another introduction clearly to politics and, and the news of the day. He recognised the strength of her character. My father bent over me, shielding the candle flame with his big hand. I cannot know exactly what thought was in his mind as he gazed down at me, but I heard him say somewhat sadly, what a pity she wasn't born a lad. My first hot impulse was to sit up in bed and protest that I didn't want to be a boy, but I lay still. It was made quite clear that men considered themselves superior to women and that women apparently acquiesced in that belief. Emmeline's father, Robert Goulden, worked his way up from illiterate roots to run a cotton printing factory in Manchester. He and his wife Sophia were part of a thriving activist scene in Manchester campaigning against slavery and for women's right to vote, also known as suffrage. 
What kind of qualities do you think she picked up from her mum and dad? She talks about, from the age of about five, actually going around collecting money at anti-slavery meetings um, with her mother. And also, I think, the experience of political organisation as well. I mean, her parents were active. There's another side which I think is quite intriguing. Coming to Emmeline's father, here we have a picture of him. This is taken in the 1870s, we know that her dad was very involved with the theatre and he was very active in setting up a dramatic group there. Oh! And active in plays there. So he was an actor. Well, they get every word, don't they? <laughs> they do, and Emmeline was very fond of going to the theatre and following people like you. She learnt, obviously, quite a lot of things about how to talk to big audiences. Projection, breathing, yeah, indeed, space yeah. awareness. All those things you know from Emmeline Pang, that's really interesting, I didn't know that. And she was clearly a remarkable speaker. A remarkable. Everyone, everyone says so. Emmeline's acting skills would become useful later in life, speaking to thousands at suffragette rallies. But her political rebellious streak started at a much earlier age. Although women were not allowed to vote, she sneaked into her first election aged just 10 to try and influence voters. It was an interest encouraged by her mum, Sophia, who was born on the Isle of Man, where they granted women the right to vote 37 years before mainland UK. The likeness is, is quite stunning, isn't it, This really? is Sophia Jane. She was going to suffrage meetings. She was subscribing to the Women's Suffrage Journal and taking Emmeline to the meetings. Returning from school one day, I met my mother just setting out for the meeting and I begged her to let me go along. Without stopping to lay my books down, I scampered away in my mother's wake. The speeches interested and excited me, especially the address of the great Miss Lydia Becker. I left the meeting a conscious and confirmed suffragist. Emmeline was born and raised for the political battle, but her birthplace had a big influence too. Even though Emmeline was an Edwardian campaigner, she grew up in a very Victorian world where women were rarely seen and certainly not heard. But here in Manchester, that was all about to change. I've come to the historic Cheatham's Library in Manchester, where Karl Marx and Frederick Engels once studied together, to see some recently unearthed archive that will reveal more. So, Charlotte, what was it like in the time that Emmeline was growing up? So, women were very much second-class citizens in Britain at this point in time. They had lots of legal disadvantages, so when a woman got married, she had to, to surrender all her property <gasps> and her earnings to her husband. Uh, it was really hard to get divorced for a woman, no matter how awful your husband was. How would men look at women? Why don't they have the vote? That's what I can't get my head round. I know, it seems really strange to us. So women were seen as biologically different because they're seen as having smaller brains. <gasps> we're seen as, as ill-prepared for the, the masculine world of work, politics. So almost like cities. children. You know? Almost like children, yes. So what was it like for ordinary women, like day to day, their lives, they're going around town, shopping, etc.? So cities like Manchester were built for men. Uh, we think of the Victorian era as the great age of civic buildings like the town hall. They just weren't designed for women. For example, you'd be really hard pressed to find a toilet in the city centre <gasps> for women. <laughs> so you get this sense that cities were just, uh, you know, very difficult places for women to navigate. You know, just being a woman on your own on the streets, you risked being called a prostitute. I'm absolutely gone. <laughs> it's absolutely horrendous. Yeah. But I can't see the women of Manchester putting up with that for long. Absolutely. So, so Manchester is a, a hotbed for political radicalism. It really is key to the whole story of the fight for women's suffrage. So we know that a real turning point for Emmeline was her experience of going to hear Lydia Becker. Lydia Becker, now, her name comes up in her autobiography. So Lydia Becker is a really fascinating woman. You know, she's very much a pioneer of women's suffrage. Lydia Ernestine Becker was a talented botanist and has specimens surviving today in Manchester Museum. She would discuss discoveries of the day with Charles Darwin. Yet as a woman, she could never make this her career. Instead, she became a passionate campaigner for women's rights. Famous across the country, she was influential in Britain's first women's suffrage society and founded Britain's first journal on the issue here in Manchester. 
Although she's been largely overlooked in the history books, when young Emmeline went to hear her speak on that fateful day, Lydia was one of the leading lights in the early fight for women's votes. So how was Lydia Becker portrayed at the time? Well, for lots of women like Emmeline, she was a real heroine, you know, a really inspiring leader and a, a really kind of um, persuasive uh, writer and speechwriter. Um, but for uh, a lot of men and certainly the press, she was heavily criticised um, and uh, really kind of caricatured and they were really critical of the way she looked and her whole campaign. Some things don't change, do they? They really, really don't. So if we have a look oh, at some yes, of the please. ways that she was, she was portrayed in the press. Mm -hmm. So these images here, this is Lydia portrayed as a donkey. <laughs> and she's being <gasps> ridden <laughs> by um, Jacob Bright, who was um, an important Manchester MP yeah. and is a great uh, friend to the women's suffrage movement. And you can tell it's Lydia from the glasses. <gasps> and she's, a, she's an unmarried woman, which... Oh, uh, how dare she? So she, for just that alone, she was a source of suspicion and hostility. So we've got some more cartoons here. There's Jacob Bright going to Westminster with Lydia's head on a spike. It says, a vision on the way, beware female suffrage. So all this horrendous mockery of Lydia, how do you think it influenced Emmeline's opinion on what she had to do next? Because it must have frightened her in a way. I think it would have been frightening. Mm. I don't think we can imagine how difficult it would be to have been um, a woman in this era and take on a political role and just have to take on all that abuse, you know, that... Every single day. Absolutely. But I, I think it would have also motivated Emmeline. She would have been angry, I think. I think. She, absolutely. I probably believe that she would have learnt lessons from it. If she was going to go down this path, mm. Mm. Her eyes were open because of all this barrage mm. and this vile, you know, um, press against Lydia. Mm. So I suppose, in a way, without Lydia, there probably couldn't have been an Emily. Lydia Becker hit national headlines in England when in 1867 she marched a woman called Lily Maxwell to the polling booths in Manchester to vote 50 years before British women won the right. Although Emmeline would have been just nine years old, it was a massive event in the fight for women's votes, and one that would have a ripple effect on her life too. Nowadays, Lily Maxwell's landmark vote has largely been forgotten. I'm here at Manchester Central Library to find out more. So, Kate, who was Lily Maxwell? Well, Sally. He is a photograph oh, of her. Here she is. Ferocious looking lady. She looks rather stern, yeah. yeah. Then again, I think I would be in those days as well. Well, quite. So she was a widow. Right. And she had a small shop. Mm -hmm. And on this next photograph, oh, yeah. we've got the street oh. that she lived on, Ludlow Street Ludlow in Manchester. Street. Yeah. So the crucial thing about Lily is because she was a widow, she was the householder. So she paid taxes, she... That's right, right. She, she paid her rent and as a consequence of that, she appears to have been taken for someone who had the right to vote. So she found herself on the electoral register by accident, so far as we can tell. So how did that happen? How well, we, don't, we really don't know, but what we do know is... And here in this document is the actual evidence and there she is. This is the Register of Voters, Register of Voters. for the Borough of Manchester, oh. 1866 to 67. Here's Lily in Ludlow Those Street, streets. in a house, 25 Ludlow Street, and this is... Woman! Woman, An yeah. exclamation mark! Absolutely. Nobody else is a woman. How did she get in there? Yeah. So this is an amazing political document in British history, isn't yes, it? Yes, it's real history, isn't it? So here we've got Lily, in the middle of the 19th century, 50 years before British women get the vote, actually registering her vote. This is a very rare piece of evidence. It's actual physical evidence that she did that. There's her vote counted. Wow. So what was the reaction at the time? It must have been a sensation. It was. So we've got various newspaper articles here, Oof. some in favour and some against. As you can see, the print on these copies yeah. is tiny. But you can he see here that it says Lily Maxwell. Lily Maxwell. She's but a headliner. We, that's right. We won't try to read those. Oh, thank you. I thought you'd be relieved, <laughs> yes. 
we'll try ah, this instead. Oh, this is better. So this one's in favour. So one woman at least has refused to be any longer a slave. The person who bears the name of Lily Maxwell, which will be immortalised in female annals. So somebody's very positive and very almost jingoistic about Absolutely. that. Absolutely, and it's sort of sad, isn't it? Because she's not really been immortalised in any big no, she way. Hasn't she hasn't at all. So we've got here the Oxford Times from Saturday, November the 30th, 1867. This piece of female voting has been obtained by a trick mm -hmm. and can only be regarded as an act of dishonesty <laughs> on the part of the strong-minded Lily Maxwell. So that's quite funny, isn't it? Because yeah. in what way was she dishonest? She's accidentally on the register. It, she's not disguised herself as a man. No, she's not gone at to all. the poll and declared publicly declared her vote. Wow. So what an extraordinary thing! But that shows you how much men, some men, opposed the idea of women's vote. And also, when she went to vote, it wasn't like in secret in a little. But it was she had to stand and declare in front of like a room full of men who mm -hmm. probably couldn't bear you being there anywhere. She stood and said she, she supported Jacob Wright and there were then three cheers for her. Well, we've seen were... she's quite a formidable looking lady, haven't yeah, we? We can imagine <laughs> <laughs> she would be brave enough to do it. How do you think this act of massive bravery mm -hmm. would affect the young Emily? I think it's reasonable for us to assume that she'd heard of it. It's in the newspapers of the day and I imagine yeah. that Emily would be really inspired by Lily. Lily's vote was hailed a victory, but it also turned out to be a setback for the cause in Britain. A famous court case followed, where judges ruled the entitlement to vote did not extend to women. The women's cause was defended by a barrister who would go on to transform Emmeline Goulden's life, Dr Richard Pankhurst. So how old would Emmeline be at this point? Well, so 1868, she's still very young. Dr Pankhurst is already involved in the cause. So. Richard Pankhurst, to her, mm -hmm. would have been almost like a, a bit of a local hero, a bit of a superstar, really. So when she met him, it was quite an amazing thing. She said, I was so charmed by him, he was so eloquent. A radical lawyer campaigning on women's rights, Richard Pankhurst was famous across Manchester. If her family had lit a political spark in Emmeline, he was the one who turned into a flame. So when these two got together, it was quite an amazing thing. So he's 43, she's 21, right. there she is at about that time. Looking absolutely gorgeous. They met at a political meeting. Uh, she was very impressed with him. And I think he was very impressed with her as well. So did they get married quite quickly? What happened then? So they, were, it, they had quite a, a, a fast falling in love and quite a serious... Huge um, meeting of minds, yeah. very fiery. Absolutely. Every suffering cause shall be ours, he said to oh. her. Oh, that's it fabulous, is. It is. It? Yeah. Married within months, the couple went on to have five children. Not only were they a love match made in heaven, but a political one too. While Richard stood for election as an MP, Emmeline became active in committees and causes, hosting political parties where she would dazzle guests with her singing. Often I have heard the taunt that suffragists are women who have failed to find any normal outlet for their emotions. It is most certainly not true of me. My home life and relations have been as nearly ideal as possible in this imperfect world. Dr Pankhurst did not desire that I should turn myself into a household machine, so while my children were still in their cradles, I was serving on the Women's Suffrage Society. Here's Emmeline from that sort of period, and we can see that she's quite glamorous. Very beautiful quite lady, Quite a glamorous isn't she? woman. She's having children quite quickly. It's quite a successful marriage in every way. But she's also, if we look at this, oh, yes. attracting some public interest already. So here's uh, the Women's Herald in February the 7th, 1891. Oh, wow. And here's a rare interview, early interview with Emmeline, long before the suffragettes as we now know them. And this is the bit I think you'll be interested in up here. So the question is <clears throat> then, you do not find your work a bar to your domestic duties? In no way. I enjoy the full happiness of home. I have four little children who, I might say, are quite as happy, quite as well looked after as any children. They are devoted to me, indeed. I think they appreciate me all the more because they don't seem too much. Wow, now that is progressive, isn't it? <laughs> 
Encouraged by Richard, Emmeline took a big step in her own political career. Standing as a candidate for the new independent Labour Party, she got elected as a poor law guardian in one of Manchester's most impoverished areas, where she quickly got hands on. It's hard to imagine the lady like Emmeline Pankhurst heading off to the market and gathering up all the unwanted vegetables and boiling them all up into a hot broth. But in the harsh winter of 1894, that's exactly what she did. She stood on the back of a lorry in various soup kitchens here in Manchester and she doled out her hot soup to the poor and the needy living on the breadline. Her new role also brought her into contact with the local workhouse, where the poor and the destitute would be sent to perform often back-breaking work in return for a roof over their heads. So you'd find a lot of women in the workhouse, women who'd been left by husbands or unmarried mothers, um, and the workhouse is particularly horrible to women who had children out of wedlock. So how do you think being involved with the workhouses affected Emmeline's approach to women and their suffrage? Well, we can see that in her own words. Okay. So she says, I found that there were pregnant women in that workhouse, scrubbing floors, doing the hardest kind of work, almost until their babies came into the world. Many of them were unmarried mothers, very, very young, mere babies themselves. These poor mothers were allowed to stay in the hospital after confinement for two short weeks. Then they had to make a choice of either staying in the workhouse and earning their daily living by scrubbing another work, in which case they were separated from their babies or taking their discharges. They could stay and be paupers or they could leave leave with a two-week gold baby in their arms, without hope, without home, without money, without anywhere to go. What became of those girls? What became of their hapless infants? It's, it's so upsetting, isn't it? It was that experience that made her realise that women needed to be in charge of the workhouse to have uh, important influences at you know at the very top in government because she said you know it was men making all these decisions men controlling all these systems and women were suffering so do you think this was a big trigger in her becoming more militant I think it must have been because you can hear through that, those words her anger mm. and, and the heartbreak and the frustration she must have felt and after you know the, the peaceful careful campaigning of many decades of people at Lydia Becker she must have just uh, Emily must have felt so frustrated and just ready for action you can understand why she became militant you really can I thought I had been a suffragist before I became a poor law guardian but now I began to think of the vote in women's hands not only as a right, but as a desperate necessity. These poor, unprotected mothers and their babies, I am sure, were potent factors in my education as a militant. It was around this time that Emmeline took another step towards political activism. In 1896, Emmeline hit the headlines with her first court appearance. Now, it'd be seven years before she formed the suffragette movement, but in that moment, she realised the power of publicity in getting your voice heard, especially if that publicity involved even the slightest whiff of prison. So, how did Emmeline end up in court in the first place? Well, there's a really interesting and often quite neglected and important event in Emmeline Pankhurst's history, and it's the Boggart Hole Clough incident in 1896. Name. It's a fantastic it's name. A great name. It's actually an area of Parkland in, right. in Manchester, and it was used by the Independent Labour Party for, for political rallies for quite a long time. And in 1896, Emmeline Pankhurst, as well as her daughters Christabel and Sylvia, start giving a speech about the women's rights right to vote and um, about the labour movement there that's attended by 20,000 people. 20,000? 20, 20,000. It's a huge audience wow. for a woman speaker yes. in this period. And shortly afterwards, she is she is summoned to, to trial. She's committed uh, a crime against the bylaw of not holding a rally in this important park in Manchester. So she's in court. Yeah. And how does she appear in court? Well, there's a really interesting description 
description of her um, in the memoirs of Sylvia Pankhurst, where she describes her very feminine appearance, wearing a little pink straw bonnet and very elegant black gloves. And she, she basically challenges the very premise upon which she's been brought to court. She's very indignant about it. And there's actually a really interesting account of it oh, in a newspaper a at the time. So it describes how... This is about Emmeline in court. And she says, if the magistrate decided illegally, as she contended, to fine her, she would not pay on her own account. And she would be deeply indignant if anybody presumed to pay for her instead. <sighs> So the reason why this is so significant is because Emmeline uses the courtroom, much like the one we're in now, yeah. as a theatre ah. to actually communicate her cause and her politics to a wider public than she's previously been able to reach. Well, her dad was an actor as well, wasn't she? So yeah, he was... absolutely. So do you think that the, this was sort of pre prerequisite to every suffragette using a court as as theatre. Yeah, I think it's actually a, a real um, light bulb moment um, in the early formation of the suffrage movement. I think this was um, quite integral to her future character as the famous suffragette leader right. because she realises um, in quite a strategic way that she can use the courtroom to, to further publicise her cause. And I bet it caught the court system on the yeah. hot. Quite. Well, they were actually quite bewildered. They yes. didn't really know whether or not to prosecute her. This is Emmeline Pankhurst, wife of a famous lawyer. And they're really concerned about the effect this might have. They she actually... might go to prison. Yes, precisely. Together, Emmeline and Richard were a political force to be reckoned with. But a tragedy was on the horizon. In 1898, I suffered an irreparable loss in the death of my husband. Those matter-of-fact words in her autobiography hide the true heartache of Richard's death. Emmeline was on a trip abroad when things took a dramatic turn. While she had been away, after nearly two decades of marriage, a clearly besotted Richard was still sending her love letters. When you return, we will have a new honeymoon and reconsecrate each to the other in unity of heart. Be happy, love and love. Your husband, R. M. Pankhurst. You can just hear how much Richard longs to see Emmeline again, but it was not to be. Despite a telegram asking her to rush home as his health was failing, Richard dies as Emmeline is on her way home. Legend has it that she read of his death in a fellow passenger's newspaper, and when she got off the train, she collapsed in grief. Forced to leave their big house in a posh suburb of Manchester, she had to find rented accommodation and, for the first time, a paid job. And she came here to this house in Nelson Street, which is now the Pankhurst Centre, which is half women's centre and half museum. Tucked away next to Manchester Royal Infirmary, most people walk past this rather forgotten old building. Welcome Hello. to Emily's house. Oh, lovely to see you. So here we are in Emmeline's house. Now, what would life have been like for her here? Well, she had to downsize to come here after her husband's sudden and unexpected death. He died of a perforated ulcer. The family um, had to move here for financial reasons. He'd done a lot of pro bono work with the Independent Labour Party. Therefore, she didn't have the money to maintain the house. This was a rented property, and she describes it as being full of cheap American furniture. <laughs> she um, came here with her family, and they were completely grief-stricken. We have a census document okay. here, so I can show you how many people lived in the house at the time. It was Emily, oh, wow. <laughs> three daughters, yeah. her son, um, two of her brothers, and a cook and a servant. So it must have been really manic and busy. Yeah, amazing. So she had to get a paid job as a registrar. It, it was the first time ever she'd really had to yes. do that necessity. It was unusual for a woman in her position. And we have a second document here which shows her living in this house. This is her place of business and she was a registrar here. Ah, right, okay. 
So through that job, did she realise what was going on in Manchester? Did she realise...? Yeah, she saw the horrible working conditions of women and also the, the very heartbreaking stories. Girls as young as 13, and this is referenced in her book, used to come here to register. So it says, I have had little girls of 13 come to my office to register the birth of their babies, illegitimate, of course. In many of these cases, I've found that the child's own father or some near male relative was responsible for her state, and there was nothing that could be done in most cases. I know. It's terrible. A crime. Horrific. And, you know, the girl... I mean, obviously, she had her own daughter, she had a son, and it was upsetting for her, but, it, you know, it led to her belief that women had to help women. I needed only one more experience after this one to convince me that if civilization is to advance at all in the future, it must be through the help of women. Women freed of their political shackle. Women with the full power to work their will in society. So do you think this um, job, this job as a registrar, it was all to do um, towards the step of her being towards a militant, really? Yes. Working towards that? Well, she was a suffragist originally, the suffragist movement, which was a pacifist movement. But at the time, bills were often put forward for equal representation for, for women and men, and they were always talked down. Men are talking for us when we should be talking. We, we were taxed, as men are, because now she was working and she would have been taxed, She's income taxed, tax. Yeah. And yet she had no say in the laws of the land. And it was that impatience with um, the non-militant way. Now a working mum paying taxes, she was growing tired of words. The time had come for deeds. On the 10th of October 1903, encouraged by her daughters, Emmeline set up a new movement. I'm meeting her great-granddaughter, Helen Pankhurst, to find out more. So we're sat in Emmeline's home and we're in Manchester, and this is where it all started. That's quite amazing. Yeah, it has a wonderful feel to it, it does, actually, yeah. doesn't it? It really does. So this is the home where the suffragette movement started. Uh, it was called the WSPU, the Women's Social and Political Union, mother and daughters primarily, who just decided enough was enough, a new way of campaigning on women's issues was needed. And why do you think it was decided here and now? So it came on the back of more than 50 years of campaigning, more than 16,000 petitions, and a sense that nothing was changing. What was the, the final straw? There was a fundraising for, in memory of Richard Pankhurst. In fact, actually, I think initially they wanted to raise money for the family because they were now of course. a mother with all these children. children and, no, yeah. and then she, she said, no, let's, let's use the money another way. They decided to build a hall in honour of Richard Pankhurst. And they asked Sylvia Pankhurst, my grandmother, to do the decorations. And then they decided that it would be a hall for just men. <laughs> so... Oh. You know, after, after everything that they knew about what he stood for and, and who he was, where she was and emerging, what and, he believed and, in. And, and the daughter. And so can you imagine a mother, a wife, who then has to face this indignity? You just feel anger, don't you? I feel, even now, in this room now, I can feel the anger that she would have felt of, how dare you yeah. do that? Outraged that the Independent Labour Party would not let women into their meetings at the hall, Emmeline was persuaded by her daughters, Christabel and Sylvia, into more militant action. What's really interesting, actually, is this is a mother and her daughters. At the end of the day, that's, it's a family structure. It's a family relation. The family relationships are at the core of this. Mm. I've got some really uh, interesting photos here of uh, that, of the daughters. So here we have Christabel, uh, after having graduated in law, and she can't, she's not allowed to practice as a barrister. It's outrageous. Yeah. It's, it, what a waste, though, what society. A waste. What a short sighted, yeah. annoying waste of society. Uh, it's, uh, it's beyond me. And here's my grandmother, Sylvia, painting. Uh, she had to, in the end, choose between painting or her commitment to a political um, voice and to women's rights, and she chose. Women's voices so and they women's gave rights. Everything really. They didn't did. They? In their I mean. own way, in different ways. But I also think it's important not to just think of it as a negative um, mm. factor because they gained sisterhood, commitment, a sense of purpose, fun. Um, the vote. The vote. <laughs> a minor, a minor achievement. For us. Yeah. You've got these strong girls that you're bringing up. Uh, one wants to become a barrister, the other wants to become an artist. And you see their opportunities thwarted. So do you think this was a turning point for Emmeline as a character to become a leader, a figurehead almost? All these different factors then mean that gradually, gradually, she becomes the leader that we associate her image and her name with. 
As the leader of a new movement, Emmeline adopted a formidable public image to match and to inspire an army of women. Because you have on the one side the frailty, the femininity, um, the poised leader, um, but really a, a feminine I image. And then on the other hand, she is a leader of a movement. It's a, it's a military movement. She's it's a, a masculine. She's yeah. a general. And contrast the two. And also really important that you bring up this feminine side because otherwise the media that wants to attack you will present you in a very different way. Um, and it's the combination of the two that's just so rich and interesting. Like it very famously happened to all the suffragists before, the media ripped them apart, so she'd obviously learnt from that. They can't really go at what I look like because I am the epitome of Edwardian um, womanhood. Femininity, yeah. And feminism. That's right. I suppose when you see the marches, that comes out as well, doesn't it? They are marching as a band, they are marching like men, but they're in white, they've got the colour, I mean, the branding of the purple, white oh, and uh, green, the whole thing. She was a master of PR, basically. Over time, it would become an army. But it was in Manchester where the fight really began. And it was here at Manchester's Free Trade Hall that that first real shot in that battle of the sexes was fired. When in 1905, Christabel Pankhurst and Annie Kenny insisted that the demand for women votes was heard. This newspaper account of the court case that follows tells of the drama of their arrest. They put questions to certain of the speakers on a subject in which they were interested, and in order to emphasise them, one or both mounted the seats they had occupied and yelled and shrieked to the utmost of their ability. Miss Panker spat in the face of the superintendent and also in the face of the inspector, and the latter officer she also struck. In the street, they were both told by the police and their own friends that they ought to go away quietly. Well, they did not. And the inspector was a second time assaulted. The defendant's behaviour was such as one as accustomed to attribute to women from the slums. You can just imagine the scene as those women were dragged cooking and screaming from this very spot. Now, they did this deliberately for maximum publicity, and it worked. So when Christabel and Annie got arrested so publicly, what was the impact of that? Well, it was still very shocking at the time to see these two ladies be arrested, be actually dragged out of the Free Trade Hall yes. in Manchester. And for Christabel to then spit in the face of a policeman, such was her determination to be arrested. Yes. I mean, it's just not behaviour that one would have expected so of, a, to do of a lady. To get arrested. She did. She actually, uh, she writes that she she would have punched him, but her arms were held behind her, wow. so she spat in his face instead. And so what was the effect in the courtroom? Well, I think it was electric, so they're able to come into a courtroom like this, and if you can imagine it, if we look at them, um, yes. look at the courtroom here, and imagine them stood in that witness box, um, surrounded by men. We can even see a picture of it. Oh. Um, so we have these kinds of pictures of, um, so this is Christabel and Emmeline and Flora Drummond defending themselves much later on um, in the suffragette movement. And they're surrounded by men. They're also surrounded by public spectators and the press, and they are arguing their cause. You can see with all their notes and their prep. Yeah. Uh, they know why they're there. Any means of arrest to get in the courtroom, this was a huge tactic for the suffragettes. This was a military manoeuvre. Absolutely. This is, this is a strategy, pure and simple. I think um, the phrase military manoeuvre actually describes it really well. Both women were sentenced to prison. Seeing the national sensation it caused, Emmeline was persuaded that militant measures were the way forward. Their new tactics, more violent than the suffragists, earned them the derogatory nickname in the Daily Mail of the suffragettes. But they adopted this with pride, and so began a campaign that would escalate from demonstrations to burning down properties and other violent protests, leading to more court cases, prison, police brutality, and horrific force feeding for the women, but also maximum exposure for their cause. What good did it do? We have often been asked that question, even by the women our actions spurred. 
For one thing, our heckling campaign made women's suffrage a matter of news. It had never been that before. Now the newspapers were full of us. This was the start of the suffragette movement as we know it, which was very different from the suffragists that went before, because the suffragettes had one mission, and one mission only, and that was to get the vote by any means possible. And we've got some fantastic archive here at Manchester Central Library to show us just how big that movement was. So here, we've got picture cards of the leading ladies of the day. So there's one here of Christabel, and there's a signed one here of Emmeline herself. And this just shows how famous these ladies were. And they were given out to their loyal supporters, almost like actors now give out signed cards to their fans. And then we've got this amazing ribbon, which would be bought at the rallies, so you could wear your colours with pride. And this is the most amazing thing. This is the Holloway prison badge, which would be given to all those ladies that suffered the barbaric, horrific prison sentences that were given to them. And they'd wear their badge with pride, and Emmeline Pankhurst was never seen without hers. And here we see some letters written by Emmeline herself. And these show just how organised the movement was, because there's a committee here, there's a list of the committee here, and there's so many of them, and you can see that they're organising the entire country. The movement was growing and getting together, and all these letters were being sent across the country to plan the next move. So certain factions, there is a perception of Emmeline and the suffragettes being too militant, and it went against the course, and it would have happened a lot quicker without them. And what, what are your thoughts on that? So much, but let me try <laughs> and um, summarise. So my first point is... You cannot talk about the suffragettes' actions without talking about the government responsibility for forcing them into a corner, for yes. not giving them a voice, for treating them abominably. Yes. I mean, the, the abuse that they suffered, and let's just not go there because yes. the level of violence is just yes. appalling. Horrendous. You've got a government with all the power that's stamping down on them, squashing them, quashing them. And they try, so they try and manoeuvre, and time and time again they're being rolled back in and they're being silenced. So they find more and more militant ways. Never do they hurt a person. They suffer and suffer and suffer. Um, they attack property because they understand that property is the one thing that maybe the government worries about more than anything. Everybody, anybody, anybody listening to this, anybody involved in any issue, I think you take it, you take it, and there comes a point where you say enough and we have to try something different. And the militancy comes from that. And just it, from the comfort of our seats to say, oh, well, that was naughty, no. it's just not good enough. As the leader of the suffragettes, Emmeline led by example, with her willingness to face the hardships of prison for the cause with dramatic results, as this archive from the People's History Museum in Manchester shows. So this amazing front page has really caught my eye. Could you talk me through that? Absolutely. So this is the front cover of the Daily Sketch after one of Emmeline's many arrests. And it has these really powerful words, Mrs Pankhurst again defeats the law. Um, and it shows her in her prison cell. The picture really demonstrates all the, the horrors she would have suffered while she was in prison and treated appallingly. Mm. So it kind of has the mix of both messages of, of power and also kind of the horrors that went with it. And she'd been treated like a common criminal, which is not, wasn't it hunger strikes? She went hunger strikes. It, it really damaged her health in the long term as well. So even though this image is quite a defiant, powerful mm -hmm. image, it still highlights how much suffering she went through and how much suffering she believed she had to go to. She would do whatever it took to win the vote for herself and for and for women. Their mission eventually took them to London and Parliament, but a banner recently unearthed shows Manchester never forgot. Helen, tell us about this amazing banner, this exquisite piece of art hanging there. So the banner was made in 1908 by the Manchester Women's Social and Political Union um, and it was made to be taken down to London um, on the biggest suffragette rally that had happened so far and it has a very, very powerful message on it. It says, first in the fight, Manchester founded by Mrs Pankhurst and that was very, very deliberate. It was there to tell people that Manchester was the place where all this had begun. Manchester had been a city that bred radicals. We can go back and look at Peterloo, the Chartists and finally 
Valley, the suffrage movement, even before the suffragettes, it always had women fighting for the vote. The suffragists were there as well. And which is why this message doesn't just resonate with um, the suffragettes. It tells the story of Manchester as a whole. What Manchester does today, the rest of the country will do two weeks later. That's what the suffrage campaigners always said. And I'm, really? I think that's exactly what Emmeline Pankhurst would have said as well. So why have I never seen this amazing banner before? I mean, this is literally my kind of thing. It's the kind of thing I'd travel to see. So where's it been? This banner, since it went on all these incredible marches and rallies, has actually been in a charity shop in Leeds for the past 10 years. And it was discovered, folded up there um, and bought out to auction and we were able to raise enough money through the incredible people of Manchester and the rest of the country and we were able to bring the banner back home. It seems that everybody's just woken up to this amazing thing that happened and it started right here in Manchester. Absolutely and that is why this banner is so important. I mean it says Mrs Pankhurst on it. It was a real dedication, a token of her success in starting the, um, the suffragette movement and the WSPU but it also stood alongside her on platforms right here in Manchester in Heaton Park. Oh, really? We have so many reports of her marching alongside this and it shows her dedication to Manchester and the movement that she started here and hopefully it will show it now to the rest of the city how important Manchester was to some women winning the vote. Years of militant action, petitions and marches on Parliament followed. Ultimately, the vote for women was won, first for women over 30 with property in 1918, and then with equal voting rights to men in 1928 for all women over 21. Sadly, Emmeline never lived to see this final victory in her life's battle. She died on the 14th of June, 1928, at the age of 69, her body frail and weak after enduring 13 hunger strikes, weeks before the final bill in Parliament was passed. But even at her funeral, this article of the day shows that she was still very much the general of her army of women. The funeral cortege was awaited at the Fulham Road entrance to the Brompton Cemetery by a large number of suffragists. As the procession marched along, the people waiting either side fell in behind till it was an army that marched. Another crowd of people was already waiting by the open grave, which was lined with laurel, ivy and privet and surrounded by a carpet of grass. Little space was left for the clergymen and the 10 women pallbearers and the mourners, but the police made way for them and very reverently, the body of Emmeline Pankhurst was committed to its resting place between the drooping boughs of a small tree. Although she had gone, already a legend was being born. Manchester has never had a monument to its famous daughter. Finally, she's been honored in her home city with a statue by sculptor Hazel Reeves, who has brought along a scaled down model to show me. Hi Hazel. Hi, look at her. She's magnificent. Oh, congratulations. Oh, and she's got the prison badge. She has a Holloway brooch, yeah. What a detail, she's amazing. Now, why has she stood on a chair? Well, this was a street meeting as they used to have and the suffragettes would be ringing bells, summoning people out in the streets. Somebody would grab a chair as like a makeshift rostrum and up the five for Emmeline would climb and address the crowds to rise up and demand their vote. Wow, she's amazing, you know, when I used to do stand-up round the pubs and clubs of Manchester here, um, there was some that, you know, there was no stage or anything or equipment and you had to go and grab a chair and stand and do your stand-up in the corner. And it was terrifying, absolutely oh, terrifying. But... And look how confident and amazing she is. She's not really bothered, is she? She just yeah. wants to get a message out. Absolutely, yeah. So where's she going to be? She's going to be in St Peter's Square. She's just... Just over there, yeah. yeah. I think it's, it's very profound for the children of Manchester as well because 
I think they can be inspired, especially the little girls, to come and look at her in that meeting place and know the story and know the struggle and know that was a Mancunian who did that. Exactly. That's really yeah. exciting for me. And what do you think Emmeline would think about her statue being in the middle of Manchester, so tall and proud? Well, I hope she'll be proud. And But I guess if she was here now, she would be saying, we've got a lot of work to do. Oh, we have. And she'd be grabbing a kitchen chair, climbing atop it, and urging sort of young girls and women to use their voice, use their vote, and champion the rights of those that have been left behind. And keep fighting for us. Keep fighting, keep marching. Keep exactly. fighting. Brilliant. I think it's still hard today to understand how much courage and determination it takes to endure 13 hunger strikes in prison, to press on with your political beliefs in the face of ridicule and violence and arrest. But now, I think I know why Emmeline did it. Emmeline to me now is not just a, a global icon. She's a living, breathing human being, a charismatic, passionate woman, a devoted wife, a working mum. She didn't just believe in politics, she believed in people. And when she witnessed firsthand the atrocious treatment of women around her, she decided to do something about it. She decided to fight with deeds, not words, to make that change happen. She was born into the right family at the right time, but I believe she was also born into the right city. And I'm so proud that we are finally celebrating her here on her own turf, so her voice will be heard for generations to come. They were awake at last. They were prepared to do something that women had never done before, fight for themselves. Women had always fought for men and for their children. Now they were ready to fight for their own human rights. Our militant movement was established.